Uh, we'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the land of the Shuram Nations and pay our respects to their elders, the past and the present. Yeah. We'd like to thank the University of Melbourne Energy Research Institute, our Zero Carbon Australia project partners, for this great venue. <coughs> For those of you that haven't been to a discussion group before, please at ease a big, happy, friendly group of mostly volunteers who all understand and accept that human greenhouse gas emissions are causing a climate emergency for the human race. And emergencies need solutions, so please at ease researchers, publishers, and communicates solutions to Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. Our projects include Zero Carbon Australia Research, Repower Australia Talks, media work, education programs, and much more. We're always looking for more volunteers, so come and talk to us afterwards if you want to get involved. The discussion group is a forum for climate change solutions with presentations by experts in their field and is held on the first Monday of every month. PCD has recently released carbon, Zero Carbon Australia's buildings plan shows that there's potential for 33 gigawatts of rooftop solar photovoltaic across Australia. So this month, our topic is the inevitable rise and rise of solar power in Australia. Tonight, we're pleased to have Australia's leading photovoltaic industry expert, Nigel Morris, joining us via Skype, we hope. <laughs> Nigel is Director of Solar Business Services, a solar PV industry advisor and outspoken advocate. After almost 20 years of working for other companies, including BP Solar, he established the company in 2009 with a view to providing <coughs> organisations with the benefits of his wide experience in the renewable energy in industry. Nigel is also an electric vehicle enthusiast. Would you please welcome Nigel? I'll just say we can see you and the slides, so you just have to tell me you no know, forward back. Um, okay. I'll try and keep up. Well, thank you. And you can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah. great. Excellent. How many people am I talking to, just so I know? Thousands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you include YouTube tomorrow. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, thanks very much. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure for me to get the chance to speak to you tonight and I'm um, um, humbled by the lovely introduction that I got. So I'm just gonna dive right in and um, hopefully Alistair, if you get a chance, I'm gonna uh, get some videos so that I know where you guys are up to. But if we can skip past the entry slide, I'll um, just introduce myself. Um, actually just over 20 years, 21 years this year, in fact, in the PV industry. Uh, so, um, I don't know what that qualifies me except uh, as, as perhaps being old, um, but uh, worked with lots and lots of different companies and had um, the privilege to make a living from um, uh, selling photovoltaics and other renewables for, for that whole time. Um, as you can see, uh, since uh, I formed this business about five years ago, I uh, worked with a huge variety of companies. In fact, I run out of space on the slide to add them, so I'm just leaving it at that. And it spans and a huge menagerie of different types of entities from literally from uh, small installation companies, one man installers, right through to some of the major uh, corporations in the world. So lots and lots of uh, broad experience with a whole bunch of companies. And in a nutshell, I, I, I spent about half my life doing industry analysis and research, which is the foundation for, for what we do. And then the other, the other half of my life using that data and information uh, to help businesses or, or uh, corporations to try and improve what they're doing and grow their solar businesses. Um, that's the short version of it. On the next slide, um, I thought it's much more interesting about what I do for fun. Uh, and as you can see there, I'm lucky enough to be one of a few owners of an electric motorbike. That's a Zero, uh, made in 2010 in the US, uh, in a little place called Santa Cruz. Um, hopefully you can see the specifications on the page there. On the, uh, absolute convert, uh, uh, having ridden uh, internal combustion engine motorcycles all my life. Uh, when I got hold of this a couple of years ago, um, uh, I just couldn't believe it. And um, I, in fact, I'm about to sell my petrol powered bike and I'm just gonna rely entirely on this one because it's meeting all my needs. Um, I won't bang on about it, but if you'd like to learn any more, there's uh, a lot that I'll be happy to share. All right. Um, Next slide's an introduction slide. We'll skip past that and go straight to Australian Solar Snapshot. Um, 
You guys keeping up down there? I'm flying by. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um, so a little summary of where we're at at the moment. Um, uh, you know, incredibly, perhaps Australia is is in the top ten of uh, global PV markets, and uh, although it may not seem incredible to anyone who lives in Australia because it's so sunny and electricity prices are expensive, we've been out of the top ten for many, many years, despite all the great research and everything else. Uh, but we, we got back there a few years ago and we're hanging in um, just by the skin of our teeth this year. Um, you can see all the stats there. I, I, I won't read through all the, all the notes on my slides. You can see that and I'll tend to talk around them if that's okay. Um, so, some really impressive statistics, in fact, about the number of households and the number of panels and how much of national capacity we're generating and so forth. For what it's worth, one thing that is absolutely unique about Australia, rightly or wrongly, is that in fact we have more household PV than any other country in the world. Most other countries, uh, especially over the last 10 years or so, tended to focus on generating very, very large uh, wads of PV in solar farms, uh, whereas Australia was focused very much on getting it onto rooftops, and, and uh, I'd suggest that's probably completely by accident. Um, it was more about political gain than necessarily a, a great policy decision. Uh, it's frustrated the industry and it's actually inflated the cost and slowed things down to some degree, but um, the, the uh, net result of it is in fact we've got a wonderfully distributed, um, uh, disaggregated uh, capacity in Australia that's very, very unique in the world. Um, that causes us some problems that I'll touch on in a little while as well, but nonetheless, um, that's where we're at. We'll skip to the next one. Um, always, always good to start at the top, I figure. And, and you know, when you look at what's happening in the world, the dragon has clearly awakened in the form of China. Uh, I updated this graph this afternoon um, uh, so that you could get a sense of both the importance of China in the global context uh, and also where we fit. So you can see uh, our forecast this year is that we'll unfortunately just creep back down. Uh, the charts a little bit in terms of our uh, proportion of total solar, but for such a small population in such a relatively small country uh, in population terms, we're actually doing pretty well. Um, China's rise, as you can see, has, has really all happened in the last two or three years. It, it's been absolutely astounding to watch China go from, you know, really not even figuring on the charts in terms of installed volume in country to now being um, the, this year the single largest market in the world. To give you a bit of context, the red bar at the top of 2014 uh, shows that their plan is, their target at the high end is for about 14 gigawatts of PV to be installed in country. Uh, to give you some perspective, back in 2010, you know, three and a bit years ago, that was pretty much the entire world uh, installing about 15 gigawatts. So, you know, um, it, it, it's quite profound and, and, and astonishing how fast China has ramped up. Um, there are a bunch of reasons they've done that, but nonetheless, what they certainly are doing is installing astounding quantities of PV uh, in, in uh, ever wider range of applications. So, uh, very, very impressive. Um, okay, the next slide. Uh, gives you a bit of a picture of what's gone on in Australia and like most markets around the world when you look at what's happened you know, really the big growth has all come in the last few years Australia is no different uh, we uh, really started to take off in 2011 and 2012 and um, uh, this is cumulative uh, so as you can see the, the big the big jumps were really um, 2010-2011 when we had you know, multi 100% growth but th this growth has been going on for some time uh, in, in the Australian market, but we really started to get some gusto in 11 and 12 when the feeding tariffs came into the market. Go to the next slide. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the interesting thing to look at when you look at the PV industry globally compared to other industries, and this is some data from Bloomberg, and I'll pay you credit where it's due. There's lots of data here from other companies that you'll see. Hopefully I've referenced them all right here. And Bloomberg uh, uh, presented this data a year or so ago and, and it really highlights the massive shift in, in investments from renewables to, uh, or from non-renewables to renewables. Um, and although this softened a little bit and, and uh, PV in particular wasn't, particular wasn't the big 
uh, investment uh, centre that it was back in 2011, we still remain one of the biggest growth drivers in the whole investment thing. Um, you know, around the world it is a, 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 a in excess of $100 billion of investments. Um, you know, Australia alone is about a three or a four billion dollar a market. Um, lots of uh, employees, lots of diversification, uh, plenty of suppliers, and, and you know, an absolute plethora of brands. And uh, the next slide really explains why, and that is quite simply because of competitiveness. Um, this chart's a little bit uh, complex at first, but it's really quite simple. What it really shows is uh, a low, an average, and a high. Uh, from some data that we collected and it compares the wholesale generation price which is really you know what does it cost to generate coal-fired energy or at the other extreme gas-fired energy from small peaking plants and as you can see on the left of the screen you know at the bottom end you're down around three cents for a, a, a coal-fired power plant that was built 30 or 40 or 50 years ago and you know has very very low cost of energy and, and, and enjoys lots of subsidies uh, up to new plants uh, using uh, gas, for example, where it would nowadays be in excess of 15, 16 cents a kilowatt hour. The average sits around 10, and then next to that, what you can see, and in fact this is already out of date, only six months, uh, the, is, is the relative cost, again, low, average and high, of what it costs to generate large-scale solar. Uh, you can see there that the, the low, um, uh, in light green, um, is hovering around about 10 cents. Now, um, project costs for generating very, very large scale solar are, are, are very closely guarded. But what we do know is that the lowest cost price we've seen for generated energy from a PV plant is now down at around five cents. There was a contract signed in the US not too long ago, five cents, numerous contracts under 10 cents. We're not seeing those kinds of numbers here yet. There's different dynamics at play, different things going on, but it can get down to around about 10 cents in, uh, even in Australia. And indeed, there are lots of people looking at that. The middle uh, two sets of bars are, are around commercial prices. So if you're a small or medium-sized business, what would you be paying? Again, low, medium and high. And there, of course, what you can see is that the range is enormous, uh, uh, indicative of the fact that it's a non-regulated, fully contestable market in most places. So the competition is ferocious, uh, and, and pricing structures and deals are, are, are done uh, uh, all over the place. Um, however, what you can also see is that commercial solar can really, really compete in some places. If you happen to have a customer paying the highest price and you happen to be able to deliver at the low end, uh, you will be under 10 cents clearly uh, throwing you know, perhaps 50 or 100 or 200 kilowatts on a commercial rooftop. So we can very much compete in that place, in that space, uh, but not in every circumstance. It is very much a case-by-case -case scenario. Uh, and I'll add, and I'll touch on this later, that of course that changes according to the dynamics of the uh, electricity entities that we're dealing with. Over on the right hand side, very simple, grid parity. Uh, we can pretty much be any retail electricity price in the country. Uh, if you uh, want to shop around and, and buy the cheapest gear possible, you'll be generating at 10 cents or less, and you cannot buy electricity in Australia. The average price of electricity now is hovering around 26, 27 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, if you look at time of use rates and so forth, where I am, my peak rate from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. is a, currently around 50 something cents, including GST. So, you know, it's an absolute no brainer, hence the reason why residential PV has been so powerful in Australia. Um, apologies, I'm just going to put that on silent. There we go. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So, uh, a remarkable contribution. So, th this is really about getting a picture of where PV is in Australia and uh, what, we've, what we've really managed to achieve so far. First slide uh, uh, is, is, is I've broken this down into key five, five key facts. And the first one is a copy of a, of a fantastic resource that's now available free online, courtesy of the, courtesy of the Australian Federal Tech Institute. Uh, uh, called uh, Live Solar Map, and, and I took a snapshot uh, from the map uh, from uh, Solar's best day, which was December 13th, I think it was. On that day, as you can see from the graph, uh, what Australia, what, what Solar was contributing around sense. Australia was highly significant in instantaneous power. In, in, in this is a percentage of demand. Uh, so in, New, in South Australia, for example, what you can see is we were contributing. 
uh, almost 26% of instantaneous demand, um, and that it wasn't just a second in time, it, it obviously moves around as demand fluctuates and generation fluctuates. But what it really demonstrates is that we're, we're not a drop in the ocean anymore. Um, we are increasingly appearing on these charts. It's always fascinating to jump back in and you can do live, live feeds and you can see all sorts of interesting things going on. And this is just the beginning of what this tool is going to be used for. Um, but what it does show is that we can make a really, really material contribution uh, to, uh, uh, to demand in, in a lot of different places around Australia. Uh, and of course, that's that's a real bonus for everyone except those companies who rely on selling generation at peak times to, to make the bulk of their revenue. So that's one of the challenges that we face is that we're eroding revenue streams around the country. Second fact that I think is, is worth highlighting and certainly uh, uh, when I get uh, slammed by uh, the critics and the, uh, the haters, one of the things they always highlight is, well, sure, you might be able to generate 25% of our energy for you know 15 minutes or an hour, um, but you know what the market's all about is annual it's energy. Low. PV's capacity it's factor low. is low, so you know you're really not making material contribution. Um, I, I, I'd suggest this graph, uh, which uh, a good friend of mine, Warwick Johnston, produced up at Sunwis, really kind of puts the kibosh on that. Um, we, we've gone from being immeasurable and, and you know irrelevant in, in scale and. Uh, penetration a few years ago to, uh, in the best case, generating as much as 4.5% of the monthly energy demand in, uh, in some states. And you can see them listed there. And, um, the, uh, the, our best state is Queensland for a variety of obvious reasons. Um, it changes over time, it goes up and down, but one thing that we know is inevitable is this going, it's just going to continue to grow and grow and grow. Uh, for those uh, uh, companies who rely on uh, making revenue by perpetually selling more kilowatt hours, of course, this is this is not insignificant. Three or four percent, or an average of about one and a half percent across the year, across all states and all variables. That's a material amount of money uh, in the net. And uh, so, once again, that's one of the reasons why you hear uh, some entities uh, uh, trying to beat us out. The third fact is, of course, that there's a whole heap of other value that comes from uh, putting PV. Um, we employ a, a huge amount of jobs, uh, employees, I should say. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, um, although that is intrinsically connected to the volume in the market, and as volumes uh, come off the boil, and this year, in fact, we're, we're forecasting a decline in the market for the second year in a row, and along with that decline will go a loss of jobs, unfortunately. Um, businesses are the same. They come and go as, as demand and uh, um, uh, growth or, or declines in the market um, ebb and flow, and, and those businesses enter the market or exit the market as well. So, you know, um, nonetheless, we employ more than the entire gold mining sector. We employ, employ more than the entire uh, uh, gas sector in Australia. So there are some very significant um, sectors in Australia where the solar industry actually employs more people. Uh, one of the nice facts that I uh, love to quote is the fact that when we were doing these job numbers recently, uh, we discovered that uh, luckily if you're in the solar sector, there's one psychologist for every solar employee in the country. So uh, fortunately, we've got support. Um, interestingly, there's about 5 million voting age Australians uh, in those 2 million odd solar homes. So you know, there's a lot of voting oomph. Uh, in, in Australia, um, something like 25-30% of voters are personally experiencing solar and, and um, so it, it is a very powerful political weapon and um, uh, certainly will be leveraging that issue in the coming months as we battle for, the, for saving the rep. Um, I always also like to highlight that you know, if it wasn't for the billions of dollars of private investment, mostly from families in residential homes, um, we, we wouldn't have those three gigawatts there. Yes, the government has pro provided some support and that's been uh, wonderfully uh, uh, and gratefully received. Uh, but nonetheless, there has been a huge multi-billion dollar investment by householders uh, that are effectively delivering these savings for the wider benefit of the community. And quite often when the cost of solar or co the cost of solar rebates is talked about, uh, there's a complete, complete denial of the fact that there are a whole lot of other intrinsic values that the rest of society benefits from. Fact number 
before is uh, on that topic of, of, of support. Yes, we we've had support, and, and you know, I always I always kind of just look at people and blink when they say, "Well, you got so many subsidies." Well, you know, that was kind of the point. The, the point was that all the states and the and the federal government all said, "We want." We see potential in, in solar as an emerging industry, so we want to support it. We want it to grow. Uh, we see potential for jobs, so we want to help um, get programs out there that will help create jobs and, and, and transition us into a new uh, economic normal. Uh, we also want to reduce carbon, of course, and, and uh, solar is a great method for doing that. Uh, and and uh, we're there. We, we actually did that, and we delivered or probably exceeded most of the expectations that the government, uh, both at a state and federal level, had. Um, however, what we don't get is is $10 million a year like the fossil fuel industry. Uh, we are getting more cash each year, uh, which this graph actually shows. So it's a great work done by Environment Victoria, uh, doing forecasting forward, and Treasury data shows the level of investment uh, into fossil fuel subsidies. In total, over this period, it's about $111 billion. So we're talking about massive, massive uh, financial support, uh, ostensibly for the same thing. They're, they're, they're important industries, they employ lots of people, uh, there's, there's jobs to be created, uh, there's, there's obviously no carbon reduction, but historically they've been an important employer and an industry that's been worth supporting. And uh, so uh, and next time someone says to you, well, solar only works because it gets subsidised, um, I'd like you to highlight to them that the fossil fuel industry only works because it also gets subsidised and in fact it gets subsidised to a massive degree. Uh, fact number five, um, which is always a nice one, coming back down to the, the crux of it, this is a great one that Energy Matters produced uh, 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 earlier this year and it shows the relative strength and weakness of different investment strategies. And as you can see the top, um, the top green bars are all solar investment returns depending on where you are. Obviously the sunnier and the higher the electricity rate is, the better the investment's going to be. But what you can see is that in virtually every situation, solar outstrips the returns that you can get from a whole wide range of different investments. Uh, now, not every householder thinks like an investment strategist, um, but it, it is a really wonderful, simple way to describe what a great investment solar is. Uh, at commercial levels, it's a bit tougher, and as I mentioned earlier, it's catchier. In some places, it can uh, be a very, very strong investment and deliver terrific returns. In others, it's, it's a tougher proposition. But nonetheless, what you can see is that it has a great proposition. All right, um, let's uh, let's dive into some of the challenges that we're facing, uh, uh, such as uh, some of my kids face blowing up balloons. Um, <laughs> Underlying markets, this is a good and a bad thing, but this graph really shows you what happens when you take away subsidies. The big drop there was when the 60 cent tariff was taken away in New South Wales. And the 60 cent tariff was argued against by virtually everyone in the solar industry and the clean energy industry. We all said, we don't need that much. It's, it's, uh, it's going to create a boom and a bust, but uh, uh, for political reasons uh, it proceeded and of course, as we predicted, it, it, it blew up uh, and it ran away and in the midst of a political cycle it caused an enormous amount of pain. Nonetheless, a promise is a promise and we successfully uh, got them to hold on to that promise and to um, make sure that those consumers who invested their own money uh, could retain that 60 cents, which they did, and uh, the market was overhauled dramatically. And effectively now, if you're in New South Wales, uh, you can offset uh, uh, by generating energy at the same rate as you buy. But if you start exporting energy, in the majority of cases, you will get nothing for it, absolutely zero. So that happened earlier. Uh, uh, we, we had that tariff cut and that big dramatic change in the market earlier than any other state in the country. So. It was a real litmus for if you take away that support, what happens to the underlying market? Does it does it collapse? Is there is there no market, or is there some, there some market? And as you can see, the market did come back. So the the line post uh, July 11 is really about the underlying market. There's a couple of lumps and bumps there as a result of changes to the renewable energy target that, that supports solar. So that caused another little spike there. But realistically, the, the, that if you average that out, you can see that there is a market, and it's perhaps 40 or 50% of what the market was 
even in a hyper-subsidized scenario. So um, does that mean we don't need support? No, it doesn't. We're, we're, we're battling against $10 billion of subsidies and entrenched uh, vested interests. Uh, we, we still need support and we're small and we're young and we're growing. Um, however, what it demonstrates is that, that there is an underlying market. Um, indeed, when uh, a similar change was made in Queensland, uh, the market recovered even more quickly and came back to an even more, uh, a, a higher level, even faster than what we saw in New South Wales. So we know there's an underlying market there. We know that even in the absence of, of hyper-generous support, the market will still continue to buy. Uh, so that's a great thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the next slide uh, is about the REC, and um, I could go on about the REC all night, and, and it's a whole conversation in itself. But in simple terms, these two graphs uh, show the difference in the payback of the solar system with and without the REC, in a nutshell. Um, the one on the right, obviously, uh, assumes an adjustment to the REC. Uh, in our case, not a complete cutting of the REC, that's only a halving of the value of the uh, STCs that are currently paid on solar. Uh, but what we did do here was make an assumption in our most recent forecast that that was pretty likely. Uh, there's a, a worse case than this and there's a better case than this. But we assume that this is pretty likely to happen. And you know, the, the impact of the red is quite significant. It's going to blow out in the worst case to in excess of 10 years uh, for a payback period on a three kilowatt system. However, you can, you can also see that there are still some states that are below uh, or around about that sort of six to seven year mark. That, historically, that seems to be about the point at which most consumers can get their head around an investment. Uh, it's about the same as the average ownership cycle. So it's logical that it fits in around there. And we can see that over time, we expect it to continually decline uh, with both increases in electricity costs and decreases in solar costs. So as time goes by, we'll keep getting um, better and better and better, but the impact of the rent um, will not be to destroy the solar market, but it will set us back years and years and years, and it will certainly make life a whole lot harder for many, many people out there and be the cause of numerous businesses shutting down. So it's a, it's a very, very important issue for our industry right now. On the topic of the rent, the next slide talks about what we call the cumulative stack. One of the issues we have right now is when you look at the major mechanisms and programs and incentives and drivers in the market, uh, and, and I've listed them there, um, there's actually about, uh, about eight major drivers in, in the market um, that ebb and flow and have different degrees of impact in, in markets. However, the issue that we're facing right now is that virtually all of them are under threat. Every single one of those programs has either been threatened or already shut down or a promise has been made, or there's a review going on, or in some cases, for example, feeding tariffs, they're pretty much already gone. So the big issue that we have right now is, is not that um, uh, we're, um, uh, we, we can't even predict that the programs that are in the market are going to stay at the moment. In fact, the business as usual scenario is that most of these go uh, or, or are cut dramatically and um, the cumulative impact of all of these programs hitting us at once is a typical uh, 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 policy reaction to uh, markets. Uh, I often talk about the, the pendulum of political favour and it's swung in our favour uh, on some, in some uh, past years and, and probably gone more generous than it needed to be and in the last six months it's swung all the way back the other way and we now have virtually every program looking at being an axe and so often uh, in, in political circles the unintended consequences of that accumulation of, of, of programs is lost on policy makers because they tend to look at isolation in programs. Um, so we have uh, a lot of issues that we're facing right now beyond the rep it is, is certainly the number one uh, issue. And the only other one that I haven't really mentioned there, of course, is, is sentiment that's driven by leadership. And we've measured this before. And uh, it is absolutely clear that when government uh, and our political leaders come out and encourage consumers to invest in technologies like solar, uh, believe it or not, consumers do listen. Uh, if they're being told that it's a good thing, they're being told that it makes sense for the community and the environment and everything else, 
consumers uh, feel bullied by that and they, uh, they do respond. Um, uh, alternatively, as we saw in New South Wales when we were most vigorously attacked by the government, uh, uh, when uh, we uh, beat them on the 60 cent issue, they attacked the industry and they uh, created a scare campaign about solar and uh, in fact that uh, created a whole lot of myths and, and, and fear in the community um, across a whole wide range of issues that solar was in fact a, a big problem and you should stay away from it. So uh, the, the other thing that adds uh, on top of this cumulative stack is the, the sentiment. The next slide, um, and I'm probably going to keep on, we started a bit late, so I'll just, I, I won't dwell on this too long, but if you could summarise where the electricity market is, is in one single slide, this one by the Grant Institute that they produced earlier this year is a great one. What it shows is really the, 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 the overall picture of what's going on in the networks and the electricity industry as a whole. Firstly, what we can see is that the network companies, the guys who own the poles and wires, who are predominantly government-owned, have been making more revenue um, at, at a rapid rate and uh, per, uh, in perpetuity uh, right back to 2005. They're, they've been making more and more money and higher and higher returns for a long, long time. What we can also see is that uh, real wholesale prices, so that's the generation cost, has actually been falling in that same period. There was a spike in 2012, 2013, and in fact, it's come back off again uh, this year a little bit. Um, but real generation costs have been falling, yet electricity prices are going up. Uh, underneath that all, you can see net consumption, and on this scale, it, it, it belies the impact. But of course, energy consumption has been falling uh, somewhere around 5 or 6% each year for the last year or so, so it's pretty significant, again, in the energy terms. Um, and add to that the fact that retailer profits have been increasing and you really get a, a, a pretty clear picture of the dynamics of what's been going on in the market. Uh, I won't dwell on that too much because I think that's a great snapshot of the entire state of play uh, in terms of what's going on. Interestingly, on the next slide, you can see that it's not just us saying this. In fact, it's the ESAA, the Electricity Supply Association of Australia, one of their peak bodies, who highlighted the same thing. They're noting that the wholesale price of electricity has come down, uh, the value of the net has gone down, um, uh, and the renewables and, and gas uh, power stations are the new investment. That's where 90% of all the planned investments are going. So um, it's not just us saying this, the Electricity Supply Association and a whole lot of bodies are uh, very much aware, patently aware of what's going on. Next slide, focusing on a little bit more on PV specifically, I, I, I thought it was kind of worth talking just a little bit about where we're at in the world of PV. Um, capacity, uh, so that is factory capacity to make solar panels around the world, is a great place to start because the supply and demand balance is fundamental to everything. Uh, and as you can see on this graph, the, the balance has very much been out of, out of kilter. And this is out, not abnormal. A lot of industries, uh, not just the solar industry, sort of lurch from having too much capacity to not having enough. Unless you're in a very, very mature, stable industry, you'll always be a little bit out of whack. Um, but we got really out of whack uh, in the last few years, and that um, um, uh, really uh, has caused, uh, there's been an upside and downside to that. The upside has been has driven prices down because everyone wanted to keep their factories running, so they lowered price and lowered price and lowered price to keep their factories running. The downside of that is it got so bad, or got so low, that many factories were selling below cost, and of course there's been a whole lot of pain. Uh, Right now, that, that is being corrected, and in fact, it's happening in China at a rapid rate of knots where there is uh, forced industry consolidation, forced closures, and, and, and China represents somewhere around 60% uh, of global PV manufacturing capacity now, so that's really where it has to happen uh, most. Uh, and indeed, it's happening right now. There are, there are very real cases of small companies and even medium-sized companies either exiting, being forced into closure, or being gobbled up by larger entities to consolidate that uh, that volume and get the excess capacity out of the industry. Um, getting that balance right is crucial when it comes to cost, uh, which is where the next slide uh, goes. It really talks about cost and price. Um, one thing that I uh, that I always uh, like to make sure that um, anyone I'm chatting to understands is that. 
the massive declines of 30%, 40%, 50% per year cost or price declines that we have seen are pretty much over now. Uh, you can see them sort of starting uh, around 2011 and, and dropping down dramatically. This, this slide was from a recent Trinisola presentation on the, on the same issue. And that, that big decline has gone. Uh, uh, the learning curve uh, says that uh, uh, prices should fall by 20% for every doubling of capacity and of course we can't double capacity, we've still got excess capacity. Uh, so we, we can't reasonably expect prices to fall uh, anything like what they had uh, historically fallen, firstly. Uh, and, and secondly, of course, as you can see from this graph, underneath here, uh, the, the red dotted line is, is an assumed cost point. So the, the line above is, is really the, the average selling price, and then the red point is a cost point. And so as you can see, around 2011, effectively the entire PV industry was selling at cost or below, and obviously no one is going to survive doing that. So it has to come back up, and in fact those prices are already started, have already started coming back up in the last six months. Uh, there's a, uh, more dynamics than simply, uh, at play than simply the ability to throw a price up. And there's some future things that we're going to to come across uh, that Trina highlighted, for example, uh, out in a few years' time. Uh, the cost of silver could, in fact, be one of the major uh, uh, drivers of PV price because it's going to become an increasingly important component of the, the makeup of a solar panel. There is silver used in the construction of a solar panel. And, uh, you know, if, for example, the, the spot price of silver goes through the roof, uh, then we're going to be faced with increasing costs. And as, as silver becomes a larger proportion of overall cost, it can actually significantly influence uh, the, the, the price. So, we are going to see huge cost declines, we're going to see incremental declines, and in fact, uh, we'll probably see some increases uh, unless consolidation at scale offsets those increases by reducing some, some costs. The next slide really um, gives you an Australian context on this picture, and what it shows is not only uh, uh, that, that, that cost decline in more recent terms, uh, but it also shows the double impact in terms of foreign exchange. Uh, as you would all well know, our currency has, has moved around dramatically over the years, and what this chart shows is the changing trends between uh, the Australian delivered price of a PV module indexed against other currencies. So you can see, for example, that although the, the blue line, the euro uh, uh, dollars per watt, has been relatively stable for the last year or so, the Auss Aussie dollar uh, has affected PV prices in Australia by creating spikes and uh, 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 peaks and troughs, and we've crossed over uh, the, the US dollar a couple of times, um, and, and currently we're in a, in a, in a quite a flat plight, a flat place, uh, which means that we're currently paying more for PV just because of the foreign exchange rate than we were just a few months ago. The next slide uh, talks about profitability, so that's really the sum of those previous things we've been touching on. Uh, what this shows you is, um, uh, going back a couple of years, the, uh, the margins from different uh, publicly listed uh, solar company stocks, and you can see some pretty dramatic uh, below the below the line uh, results there, which are very very substantial losses. Now losses aren't necessarily a bad thing in in, in the medium and long term. Many many companies make losses uh, because they have a longer term vision, they have a longer term plan. However, it gets to a point where the losses can become so big that they're impossible to recuperate, they're impossible to dig your way out of. And there are some very very big numbers at play here. Uh, uh, so that just gives you a. Uh, an idea of what life has been like in the last few years in the world of PV. It has been a, a perilous place if you're a PV manufacturer, uh, with declining margins even at the best, uh, in the best performing stocks, and certainly the worst ones have been in a real mess. All right, let's um, let's crank it up a notch and look at the future to round out uh, for uh, this presentation. Um, one thing that we can see from uh, the future is that change is inevitable. Um, the death spiral is the next slide, and what that really uh, highlights, you, you may have heard talk of the utility death spiral, and one thing that is clear, and this is utilities, uh, not only observers uh, outside the electricity industry seeing it, but, but it is absolutely essential that utility companies either evolve or perish. They have no choice, 
The market is changing around them and they cannot continue to operate their businesses and do things the same way they have done them for the last 50 years. They can block and they hold enormous power uh, so they can slow things down and they can control things and they can skew things a bit. But what is absolutely inevitable is that consumers uh, want more control over their energy costs. Uh, they uh, will increasingly uh, affordably be able to generate their own energy and take control of their energy costs by generating energy with solar. Uh, and, and so we're, in, we're, in, we're going to be in a situation where we're already heading towards a situation where it's kind of like the end of landlines as, as the industry transitioned to mobiles. Um, and the entire phone industry had to rethink the way it was doing business. It was painful, it was ugly, but they had to rethink the way they were doing business. And utilities are going to have to get there as well. Um, there are some out there, a small number, but there are some out there who are really thinking innovatively and doing some creative things. Uh, not many in Australia, unfortunately. Uh, competition is already driving this, and what we're seeing is some of these more innovative utilities coming to Australia and pushing uh, the envelope a bit, which is going to help drive things, and I, I really welcome that competition from innovative uh, retailers and, and other players uh, in, in the electricity industry because they're showing the, the old school how to do it. For what it's worth, one of the big challenges that we have, uh, just using New South Wales and Queensland as an example, is that about 15 odd percent of state revenue comes from the electricity, uh, uh, either ownership of mines and coal royalties or, um, or uh, uh, revenues from distribution and transmission networks. So that is a very, very large proportion of state budgets. So you can understand the very real concerns um, that exist in government, and state governments particularly, they can't simply go, okay, yeah, we'll blow it, we'll just go solar and give up on, uh, uh, on the, uh, our old coal-fired power plants. They can't do that. They have to completely restructure the way they operate their state budgets and where they get their revenues from and how their businesses operate, and that's going to take quite a bit of time. So, you know, uh, in fairness to them, they have some very, very big challenges. Uh, the next slide, however, shows that it's absolutely inevitable because we are increasingly competitive and uh, are simply going to be there. Brie and Abair are, are, are a government uh, forecasting bodies and um, it was great to see that they finally updated their forecasts a year or so ago. And what you can see on the table circled in red is their estimates of what the cost of solar PV uh, is. And as you can see, um, heading out only in eight or 10 years, they predict that at the low end, solar will be the lowest form cost of energy bar none in the entire Australian marketplace. So that's cheaper than every other form of energy that they can think of, including coal. Of course, you've got old, uh, old coal stations and coal assets that uh, have been around for a long, long time. Um, uh, and, and they operate under a different structure. But this is the new levelised cost. And what it shows is that PV, even in the eyes of a very conservative body, is highly, highly competitive. It's going to continue to be even more so as time goes by. Um, the next slide really talks about where, again, where we're heading. And storage is something that comes up again and again and again. And every time I talk to a utility or or a retail or a distributed, distributed network owner, the one thing they, are, uh, they, they start to look a little bit freaked out about is storage. And uh, they can see that that's the big game changer and it's not uh, far away. And in fact, it's probably going to arrive um, uh, before they expect, uh, expected it. Um, but what that will look like, we don't know yet. It, it may look like batteries, it, it may look like electric vehicles. It may look like uh, hot water tanks and um, um, storing using PV, just as an example, using PV uh, to dump energy into an electric hot water tank is something that people are already doing. And that is a form of storage. And um, with the cost of PV panels where it is today, um, that actually stacks up pretty well economically. Um, it's not the most efficient way to generate hot water, um, but it is a very economical way to generate hot water. And so we, we don't quite know what this is going to look like yet, what the storage market is going to look like. Um, Australia is going to be different to the rest of the world, again, because we have so much distributed energy uh, in small residential uh, um, um, situations that that makes us highly unique. 
Um, around the rest of the world, we've seen some very, very large scale uh, uh, storage uh, systems installed as grid support. We're probably less likely to see that, although there have been some trials uh, happening in Australia on that as well. Um, but really, where Australia could uniquely head is in smaller distributed storage systems. Uh, although, of course, there's a there's a there's a cost and a complexity that comes with that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, won't be easy. It's going to have um, uh, some complexity. But I actually spoke to one of the leading uh, companies who are, who are selling storage systems just like this every day, and uh, they're making it, it's happening already. Uh, there are systems around the country, uh, and it's only going to increase. Last slide, uh, just to conclude for you, um, is, is a little bit of a summary. And you know, this market is often referred to as the solar coaster. Um, it, it never stays still, it's never uh, steady, it's always up and, or down, and you've got to have a, a strong gut to, to survive the ride at times. Uh, and indeed, um, you know, this year is probably going to be a dip. Um, it's going to be a pretty tough year. Um, Nonetheless, uh, we've just completed our latest industry forecasts looking at the future and we can conceivably see 10 gigawatts of PV up from today's three uh, by the end of 2018, only five years away from now. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, that will put us at 20% of national capacity, which is very, very substantial. Um, uh, that would hypothetically suggest we could have instantaneous penetrations of 60 or 70 percent in some parts of the country if we take South Australia as an example. So we have a lot of technical issues and control issues that we're going to have to sort out to uh, get solar happening at this rate. Um, the potential is enormous. Just looking at untapped commercial rooftops, we know that there's something in the order of about 60 plus gigawatts of rooftop potential. So enormous scope for commercial rooftop. We really haven't penetrated that market yet. There's a beautiful fit between the generation curve of solar during the day and the demand curve of businesses during the day, so that's a logical place for us to head. Um, and, and you know, this is it's never easy when you're when you're a disruptive technology, but things are happening increasingly quickly. It's going to keep rolling. Um, uh, we've got some big issues we've got to face. Uh, and our, our price decline will keep coming. Our growth will keep coming. But I also like to stress that we're not a silver bullet. We, we, we're a great part of the energy mix. There's a whole lot of other fabulous technologies out there uh, that uh, need to be part of the mix. Diversity is really key, and, and, and a really healthy, diverse mix of renewables can uh, definitely take us towards 100% renewables. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, last slide has got my details on there. I've, uh, I've talked and talked and talked. I need to get a glass of water just to um, quench my thirst, but I hope that has been helpful and, and, and of interest to you and um, uh, happy to take questions. large 
left in droves. They, 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 many of them have gone from the Australian market already. And uh, they, are, they are backing out very, very quickly uh, as the scale diminishes in the market. Secondly, what we're also seeing is uh, that consumers talk. And so with the benefit of hindsight, although a system may have been cheaper, um, uh, or their neighbour may have bought a system that you know was was insanely cheap. They tell their friends if they've had a bad experience or they've had a technical problem, and the word is getting around. And so we can now measure a very dramatic shift back towards higher quality products in the market. And um, so I think consumers were led to believe and mistakenly believe that cheapest was best. And they've learned that lesson, and by and large, are now shifting back. Um, in the, our industry has a role to play in, in being responsible, and you know we've got diversity. So you know we, we're not, not everyone is 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 is, uh, is is doing the right thing. Uh, the vast majority try hard, and consumers also have to take some responsibility. And uh, remember the old adage, caveat emptor, and uh, that you know if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Um, there's a lot of policy or going coming out of the federal government at the moment saying that by getting rid of the rate that um, you know energy prices are going to be a lot cheaper, there's going to be more jobs, you know, children are going to get better learning results, people old people, you know, uh, hair, you know. Can you um, maybe put a few, uh, some thoughts and facts around if the, the read goes um, and, um, you know, so it does come back, whether there will be any material savings, you know, in, in energy prices to consumers, or whether that will make a material, um, uh, be a material issue in terms of uh, uh, manufacturing costs or job costs. Because mm -hmm. any of the numbers sure. I've seen, it's they've been taking their playbook from uh, Grimm's Tales, you know, and other right. fantasy stories. Yeah, absolutely. There's been um, so many lies and um, absolute distortions of the truth on this issue. It, it beggars belief. The simple fact of the matter is, um, the cost of the rent. Uh, and I don't have the. I'm swimming in numbers today, uh, so forgive me. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. But the combined total cost of the red is something like about three percent of the cost of a, of a typical electricity bill. So that's the first thing to understand is that when you break down an electricity bill, the cost of the red is the single smallest component of all the components in the electricity bill, bar none. So uh, how, how you can conceivably suggest that there'll be a material change in the cost of electricity when you're, you're messing around with this, the lowest common denominator is, is just incredible to me. Uh, secondly, the cost of the rent was always set to ebb and flow, and in fact has been declining for the last 12 months, the SRES scheme in particular for the small scale stuff. Uh, and it sets decline again each year for the coming years. So the, the, the cost of the rent was already going down as a proportion of electricity bills. Um, however, when you look at some of the other costs, when you look at retail costs, they're going up. Uh, that's the profit that retailers are allowed to make. Uh, when you look at network costs, they're going up. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's, the biggest, it's the biggest beat up I've ever seen, to be honest. It's, it's just incredible to me. Um, so, will there be material reductions in price in Australia, yes, there will, but that's more to do with the fact that there's huge political pressure to keep prices down, and there's also we're at the, invent, the end of a, of a very high period of investment in networks. So uh, prices, you know, if, if everything was equal and prices stayed flat, then there would not be a material reduction by taking away the rent and indeed not even the carbon price. In terms of the average consumer, it would be immaterial. Uh, a couple of dollars a month, I would suggest, which is immaterial. So the answer is no, it's not material. And um, uh, there are other factors that are driving it up or keeping the pressure on prices down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, before, before you go to the next question, um, can you bear with me while I get a glass of water and turn the light on because I can see it's getting dark. Yeah, the outcomes in light around that the paper that we just The energy white paper? The, sorry, the, the energy white paper that was just uh, the submissions closed about a week or two ago? Yep. 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 Uh, look, who knows? Um, I, 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 you know, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, you know, what we know is that when you look at the data and when you look at the facts about what's happening with electricity prices, your data is very clear. Um, it, it shows where the rises have been coming from. It shows where the potential is for lowest cost future energy. Um, uh, it shows the cost of the rent. It shows the cost of carbon prices. It shows all of those kinds of things. And, and uh, you know, all the noise and anger is around the, the lower cost um, elements of electricity price. So. Um, I, I, um, the energy white paper is really, you know, it, it, it'll be, it, it may have some useful information that comes out of it, but um, the implications of it will depend entirely on uh, what's politically expedient and important uh, as a result of its publication. Uh, hello, Nigel. Tim Force, the uh, Melbourne Energy Institute. You mentioned that the uh, homeowners have invested billions in solar panels. Do you have a number? Uh, uh, more than eight billion is the estimate um, that most people are throwing around at the moment. Great, thanks. And also, you haven't made any comment about uh, alternative uh, ways to finance the solar panels for people like uh, leasing, etc. How do you see that playing out in Australia? Yeah, look, uh, that's a really interesting part of the market. Um, it's been growing uh, slowly but steadily for a couple of years. Um, unfortunately, it's it's um, leasing. Uh, there are a lot of different ways you could finance something, and, and um, I think the Australian market fell victim to very high cost, very crude finance mechanisms. Um, uh, which may well end up costing consumers in the long run, which is which is a great shame. Um, uh, you know, expensive consumer credit is available to anybody who's desperate enough and will sign the right thing, and that's the bulk of what we've seen so far. However, um, in the last two years since the market's cooled down a bit, we've seen um, a, a, a vast array of entities and companies into the market who. Uh, look at finance in much more sophisticated ways and are developing some uh, really fascinating and incredible models. Um, we don't unfortunately have the investment appetite in Australia uh, or the financing appetite that we've seen particularly in the US and we don't have the tax um, drivers that the US has either. Um, but it is definitely a growing part of the market and in fact in, in just completing our latest forecast over the weekend one of the things that will save us uh, from a bigger decline than we would otherwise have had is, is the financing of PV. If you, for example, assume that the price of electricity stops going up, uh, the cost of PV increases a little bit because of foreign exchange, we lose some uh, support uh, through the rent perhaps, and, and the economic proposition gets worse for consumers. And um, one way to counter that is to finance those systems. Now, financing adds another cost, of course, you've got to pay interest, um, but it does uh, give you access to a new segment of the market that we haven't tackled yet, and if it's done in a, uh, in a, in a decent and transparent and intelligent way, then it will certainly open the market up. Um, what no one really knows is how much of the market is going to take financing up compared to other countries, um, but clearly it's, it's growing. Uh, no, you mentioned you were using a electric bike to get rid of your peak imports. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, look, uh, I'm not using mine yet. Um, I've done a couple of little experiments, but uh, uh, I get 60 cents on my tiny little solar array, so I have to be careful what I do and don't do. Um, what I have been doing is working both with the manufacturer of the bikes uh, and um, the, uh, a variety of different companies who make um, control systems and um, uh, the, the, the hardware to do the 
uh, conversion of energy, sucking energy out of a battery and turning it into 240 volts and, and swinging it back into the grid is, is not the really complex bit. That's actually pretty easy and there are devices out there that we can do it with today. The hard part is actually having a, a really intelligent, intuitive and user-friendly control system that allows you to manage load, monitor what's going on, manage the either generation or, or discharge of your electric vehicle and, and do that all in a relatively easy and reliable way. And, and that is everyone I've talked to about this issue has said that's the key. Um, there are a number of people working on some great ideas and I think it won't be long before uh, some of those devices hit the market. In fact, you know, as one example, uh, I have my, my bike on a, um, a plug-in uh, timer that allows me to decide when to charge and when not to charge. And there was a product released in Australia just before Christmas that allows allows you to interface with that device using um, uh, wireless. So effectively, that, what that would give me the ability to do uh, is suddenly have a, a, a world of flexibility open up to me because with EVs, um, and I know from personal experience, there are times when I say, okay, now I'd like it to be charging because I know I'm generating from my solar system, or hypothetically, now I'd like it to be discharging because I know that my wife needs to do the washing and it's peak time, so let's pull some energy out of the battery because we generated it cheaper using the solar. Um, and then, you know, suddenly the sun comes out, mate rings me and says, let's go for a ride. And uh, I say, well, geez, I need to get the bike back on the charger and I need to be able to do that quickly and give it some controls. And lo and behold, this device hit the market last year where I could actually do that using a voice command via my smartphone. So it's devices like that and the control technology that are really the key to this. Um, there, there's a bunch of policy stuff that we have to get right as well. Um, the network guys are not interested in this yet, but they can see it coming, but they haven't developed the regulations and controls uh, yet. So, you know, um, you can't um, buy energy off peak, fill up a battery, and then discharge it into the grid at peak, for example. And, for, for logical reasons, you know, they don't want you gaming them. Um, it's okay for them to game us, but they don't want us gaming them. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to work through these kinds of issues, but I think it's actually going to happen faster than, than we all expected. Um, would you agree that the, the power of the utility... ...big network on a national basis, we can potentially leverage some advantage. So, and you know there has been there has been some pretty significant progress in in uh, um, getting more control to a national level, and I, I really think that would help us. Um, it, it takes away from uh, the state budget issue as well to some degree, uh, and you know that that at the moment is one of the biggest issues, biggest issues that we've got is that it's you know electricity is contributing so much to state revenues that you know you can understand why the why the states don't necessarily want to tell us everything that's going on or, or hand it over. Great. In an ideal Australia, what do you think the energy company should do? Wow. Mm. In an ideal Australia. Um, uh, that's a really that's a really good question. Um, don't know that I can answer it without boring you to death with a long uh, array, but um, I, I, I think I think one thing is absolutely clear about Australia, right? We have, we are blessed with a lot of non-renewable resources, clearly. Uh, but we're also blessed with some of the best renewable resources in the world, firstly. Uh, secondly, we have more than enough land uh, to generate a huge proportion of our energy from renewable resources. Uh, and we uh, are suffering from, apart from coal and iron, and even that's started to decline now, um, you know, what we really need is more things that we can do intelligently in Australia and export to the rest of the world to keep our economy strong. I think one of the best plans that I've seen in a long, long time was uh, some work done, um, and forgive me, I think it was decent who did this work, but uh, there was some work done recently with the prospect, with, with, with the concept of putting gigawatts of solar up around the um, 
um, the Old River Dam up in the northwest and using solar to, uh, in combination with the hydro system that's up there, to allow us to pump water up to a storage mechanism and then release it down on demand, thereby, therefore really creating storage using solar energy. Uh, and to run a cable across the Southeast Asia where demand is growing much more substantially and quickly than it is here, and to sell electrons. And uh, um, it strikes me that we have the land, the sunshine, we have the water in some parts of the northwest, uh, and we have the ability to run a relatively low cost deep sea cable across and export electrons, which uh, are, are thrown at us in the form of photons from the sun, and it seems so intuitively logical and sensible to me that I think if someone said, all right, it's your call, what are you going to do? Um, that's what I would do, and I would turn us into an electricity exporting nation. Okay, so although I said that BZD was full of volunteers, it still takes a bit of uh, money to turn computers on in the office and we have a few paid staff. And I haven't heard yet that we've got enough money to print the high-speed rail report. So if you think that BZD sounds like a really good organisation, you can spare a few dollars. There's a, a donations tin out there on the table. Or you can sign up and become what we call baseload supporters. And that's where most of BZD's income comes from. Just with a lot of people donating. will be on Monday the 7th of April. I can't tell you who these people will be this day, so uh, pay attention to your emails. Uh, but the, in May, on the 5th of May, uh, David Corolli will join us in person to speak about the latest climate change science. And that's it from us. Thank you for coming.